for those of you who know the work of the NCCPE, you'll know that we are a culture change agency focusing on how universities can embed more engaged approaches to their work. And we've been doing that work over the last 14 or so years. And we're super excited that more investment is now going into exploring how we can make research culture more inclusive, both of those who are within it already, but also those who might like to participate or would benefit from participating. So we're going to be thinking about the question, what are our tactics for change? How do you even approach systemic change when we all know it takes such a long time? So Jude, do you have any tactics that you can share with us? So one thing that we've done in all of the different research and action programs that we've been developing in the community is start with a mapping exercise. Um, something a bit like a political economy analysis, which allows us to identify all the different stakeholders or actors, organizations who might be engaging in different ways with the issue at stake. And this allows us to really consider who is already within our network, who hasn't been engaged yet, how different groups might respond differently to the research as it progresses and the research outputs at the end as well. And it's a really helpful way of uh, asking bigger questions around difference, around um, different types of knowledges, of, of uh, languages, of experience of conflict, whether there might be certain groups whose interests directly oppose another group, and thinking about how we then develop consensus across these different groups. And there's a lot of different resources to support mapping work in different ways at different scales. Sometimes it's very, very local. Sometimes it's regional. It can be national or even transnational too. And presumably really helps crowdsource some of the perhaps the, the people that you don't know are interested in that agenda, but actually are connected into some of the other people that you're working with. Absolutely. It's really about developing relationships. It's often like a first phase to a research project. Some funders even fund it separately as an inception or co-creation phase, which allows you to think about to try the collaboration or partnership, see how it feels, start to develop that common language and then think about who else you might need to engage over the course of the research. So, okay, so a tactic is to use mapping as a tool to enable you to do that. Other tactics for affecting change? I think we found thinking carefully about the governance is important. So, for example, putting in a research project, making sure that um, one of the co-investigators is actually a practice partner so that it's really built in and really known and kind of core to the project so it's not that you're being consulted but it's really co-done together. And do you think the way that those co-investigators are then able to to work with the research system works well from your point of view? I think it's vital. I think as researchers we're used to working within a particular register with particular sets of languages and assumptions and drivers and having someone else who really co-drives that with you but coming from a different perspective really helps that co-learning on both sides because organisations don't all want and need the same thing. We don't always speak the same language as well. One of the things we've done is organise share and learn events. Mm -hmm. And this is where we bring um, people who have been involved in the development of the REP, the Race Policy Framework, so um, public members, um, and also partner organisations together in one mm -hmm. virtual space. So it's in a, a supportive um, environment. It is about applied learning. So it's hearing, but it's actually taking practical actions and applying that to your practice. And, and it provides that kind of infrastructure for supporting people who may feel quite isolated in your work. You know, sometimes when you're driving this kind of work, you can feel quite isolated and just get into your own head. And so you need to be amongst other people who are working towards the same goal so that you've got a stronger voice, a stronger collective, and you can, you can kind of do the knowledge transfer, you can build on one another's learning. And I think the case study examples are really something that we, we mustn't underestimate the power of the case study, of the spoken word, not so much the written case study, which, you know, there are some great ones out there, but I think somebody actually storytelling is mm. mm. incredibly powerful in terms of really getting us to understand and, and step mm. into somebody else's shoes for a time to understand where 
you know, how, how health inequalities has impacted them, you know, how we actually, what we need to change, you know, in terms of the, the, the system. What does that mean in terms of the types of skills or training that we need? Because it's a hugely powerful, but also quite difficult thing to be able to yes. sit with that pain. Yes. And how are we as academics, as researchers, as community workers equipped with that? Or are there certain types of, of resources that could help us? Allyship mm. is part of it. So understand your role as an ally. Your, your voice as an ally is to... The way I describe allyship, and it's not ac academic, what you find in the academic publications, the way I describe allyship is I will get into the trenches with you and I will be your voice when you're not in the room. It is about understanding that the bias that we have and we hold and actually checking ourselves and being prepared to be checked. And part of that is about making sure that we don't operate in bubbles, as I said, you know, bubbles that, you don't operate in bubbles which just, you know, provide echo chambers for us. Mm. And it's not just about ethnicity either. Let me be very clear, because I can replicate you with just my skin colour in terms of every view that I share. Mm. It's actually about me being, being able to say, Louise, mm, that doesn't work for me. That isn't my experience. You know, it's about diversity of thought, mm -hmm. not just about what you see on paper. You know, I'm disabled, I'm a, I'm a black person. It's diversity of thought um, that we've also got to be comfortable with. So it starts with that. But also the diversities that come from the fact that we're neurodiverse and that we engage with materials and ideas differently. We bring in different insights into that space and that we just don't make the assumption in our conversations or in our work that everybody can access the information that we are putting out there without a thought. And I think so often, even the stuff around inclusion is often only accessible to a percentage of the population. And you're like, surely that has to change. And that's where it can be quite exciting as well. I think mm. as an academic, we're quite used to producing, let's say, slightly longer, maybe more dry, particular sorts of uh, publication. Um, but when you start to open up and think about how do you work, you know, how, how can we produce things that are tailored for different audiences, um, then it challenges us. It makes us think more and to produce better work. And I think, you know, animations and things like that, visual, all these different sorts of, you know, collaborations with artists that we're doing. Um, make it feel much more meaningful. It's, in, it's interesting. It's one of the reasons that, and, and uh, I still, um, I'm still not sure whether it was the right decision, but when we set up Research for All, what we were trying to do was create a space for reflections on engaged research from all those who participate in it, not just the academics, but absolutely including the academics. And we've tried to create a space where people can co-write, where indeed you're still able to put in a piece of artwork rather than a written kind of paper. And although I can see that as a, we're making a tiny contribution, loads of other forces affecting that, but it feels like pushing a pee uphill with your nose. So, you know, what keeps you going? What keeps the wind in your sails? Because systemic change is long-term work. I think it is, but I think um, for us, it's seeing the small gains as well. It's a journey, isn't it? So it's not that, bam, everything happens in one second and the world has changed. But I think seeing those incremental um, shifts. So I don't know, for us over the last 10 years or so, seeing the shift in way people uh, like STEM policymakers think and talk about the issues of STEM participation. So that notion of trying to stop focusing on trying to change young people and shift instead to changing practices. So it's not that everything's changed overnight, but when we see shifts in sort of fairly fundamental thinking like that, it's very rewarding. Or when we hear from teachers who say, you know, I've changed, completely changed the way I teach and this is the impact it's had on the young people in my class. That for me really is so motivating and it does make it feel like it, it is all worthwhile. I think it's hearing back, you know, the, the, the kind of the impact of the work to have seen and heard and truly valued um, for the first time, um, that's, you know, that's a real motivator for me. I think for me, it's about finding lots and lots of different spaces for action and changing tack or changing, relocating to different spaces when your energy runs out. So for example, I think I work quite a long time at the transnational global level fighting 
exhausting battles and getting further and further away from the objectives that we had. Um, whereas when you focus in on a particular community, in a particular place, the challenges might be as or as complex or even more complex, but you've got a different scale, you've got a different set of timeframes, you've got a different set of relationships. And similarly, working with policymakers or research funders, as opposed to within an institutional structure, is a very different experience. I feel like the more you kind of work across these spaces, the more when something isn't working, it does give you another option, another focal point. And if you can bring a few people along with you for the journey, then that kind of collective refreshing means that you can continue the struggle, whatever that struggle is, but not necessarily banging your head against the same door. And I guess the other thing that I get excited about are just the people who are agents for change in the system. So we do lots of work with public engagement professionals, really talented people who really care about inclusive practice, who've got loads of really uh, and really great skills at brokering that space, holding that space of emergence and that space of challenge, and are actually really affecting change in their own institutions. And then we see researchers who are engaged researchers like yourselves. You know, we see people who are working, you know, alongside universities who are really championing change. And then some really enlightened leaders who are really making decisions to resource this work well. Mm -hmm.